use the solar probe cup as the most recent um, program I've worked on all the way from design through flight and give you a sense of some of the design validation and performance activities related to getting SPC on Parker Solar Probe. And I'll close with just a, a little bit of commentary on future applications of Faraday Cups and then hopefully leave enough time for some good discussion. So at its most basic, what is a Faraday Cup? You might hear a, a couple related terms for Faraday Cups, retarding potential analyzers, uh, another word uh, term that's commonly used. For some reason, historically, if they're flying in the solar wind in particular, they tend to be called Faraday Cups. Uh, at its most essential, I would say that a Faraday cup is a, a solid metal cup conducting combined with a bunch of conducting wire grids that are used in combination to create regions with very simple uniform electric fields. At some point in there, you apply at least one high voltage that you can vary to one of the grids, and that allows you to screen particles depending on their energy per charge, which ones can make it in the instrument. Then you have one or more conducting plates that record the resulting currents of ions or electrons that can make it in the instrument, and the rest is uh, in the details. But varying the voltage, measuring currents, you can do all sorts of things, figuring out velocities, densities, temperatures, relative composition, uh, depending on the environment you're operating the instrument in. And on the left, uh, what I'm showing here, I thought this was a, a kind of cool photo because it actually shows you two Faraday cups working in concert. So this was a photograph taken, oh gosh, at this point about six years ago at Marshall Space Flight Center in their solar wind facility. And on the bottom here, if you can see my mouse, what you're seeing is a thermal test model of the solar probe cup that's flying on Parker Solar Probe. So this is a one-to-one -one scale model of the sensor portion of that Faraday cup, the measurement electronics, the high voltage power supply, Support, uh, supporting digital signal processing. That was all being handled on a rack outside of this vacuum chamber. Uh, but the sensor was inside this big vacuum chamber at Marshall Space Flight Center. And w one of the things I like about this photo is you can stare directly into the cup. So there's a whole bunch of different, very fine metal grids inside this opening. As you can see, they're very transparent. That's important. You want them to have as high transparency as possible. So as many of the particles uh, as possible, get through and, and hit your sensor so you get a nice strong signal. Um, and what you can see above the Faraday cup, the solar probe cup, you can see this little metal cylinder here with a hole in the center. And this is a laboratory diagnostic Faraday cup. So if you've ever worked with particle accelerators or other electron or ion beams and vacuum chambers, Faraday cups are very commonly used uh, as a nice, reliable way to measure the total current that's being produced. So in this experiment, what was happening is if you see this bright orange glow in the back, uh, we were heating the sensing portion of that Faraday cup where we actually collect currents up to about 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. You can see where that hot, where actually the back of the instrument's actually visibly glowing orange due to the heaters that are surrounding it. Uh, and what we're doing is we're measuring uh, typical solar wind currents and energies that we were expecting at Parker Solar Probe closest approach, which, which is about 10 solar radii from the sun. And we're jumping back and forth between our, our poor thermal test model, which is operating at these very high temperatures, and then this laboratory diagnostic Faraday cup, and just checking to see if there are any changes in the response of the instrument, height and noise levels, uh, for some, you know, any kind of degradation in the, the response of the instrument to a given current. And the great thing from this test was we found that uh, the Faraday cup just could care less about how hot it was. Uh, so there was no change in noise level, um, no change in calibration response as we heated it up. And that was a very important step to convincing us that the cup was going to work reliably close to the sun. Now, uh, a little bit more detail um, and some of the distinctions, at least for me, that I make between a lot of the Faraday cups that I work on and some of the more um, straightforward retarding potential analyzers uh, that you'll see. Um, a retarding potential analyzer uh, often starts at some low voltage and then sweeps up to some high voltage uh, on a grid and then just records the current versus time. A lot of the Faraday cups I'm going to show you today um, take that to a, a slightly higher level of sophistication. We call it a synchronous detection process, where instead of 
just ramping up from our lowest voltage to our highest voltage. We're actually oscillating back and forth between adjacent voltages at any one moment in time. So to show you how that works, on the left, this is a picture from a 1995 paper on the solar wind experiment on the wind spacecraft. In particular, this is a cross-section of one of the Faraday cups on wind. And on the right, I'm showing you a numerical simulation from about uh, 2001 uh, showing a cross-section of the spacecraft on what was called Triana at the time and is now called the Discover spacecraft. Uh, so what you can see, uh, let me show you on this simulation on the right, uh, this middle purple grid called the modulator grid is sitting at a high voltage that I can vary. There's a ground grid on either side of it. They're nice and parallel. And so what you wind up getting is a uniform electric field uh, that's continuous from one side to the other, and it's just pointing uh, perpendicular to the uh, surfaces of the grids. So if I send a beam of ions coming in this simulation, we just had a broad spectrum of ions with different energies. If the energy of those ions is below whatever the threshold energy per charge is, given the potential between these grids, they just slow down, they get deflected, and they leave the cup. If their energy is above some threshold, uh, then they enter into the cup, and once they've passed the high voltage grid, they get reaccelerated back to their original energy, um, and then they pass through. We often put in a little, we call it a limiting aperture, uh, and then hit the back of the instrument where you have one or more collector plates. So consider on the cross section on the left, one second, I just need to close the door. Consider the cross section of the instrument on the left here, and at one instant in time, I have some voltage applied to this high voltage grid. I'll have uh, two categories of particles. Particles with insufficient energy per charge coming straight into the couple get deflected out. Particles with sufficient energy per charge pass all the way through and hit that uh, collector plate in the back. Now, what if I jump back and forth between two nearby high voltages at some frequency on the wind spacecraft or on Discover? we jump back and forth between two adjacent voltages at uh, 200 hertz on Parker Solar Probe. It's and, and the Voyager spacecraft, we jump back and forth at, at faster than a kilohertz. Depends on the application and the mission, exactly what voltage you pick. And I can rattle on about why we pick different frequencies um, and voltage uh, increments if people are interested later. Uh, but if I jump back and forth between two nearby voltages, then I'll have a special population of particles with a energy per charge range that's between those two voltages. And as I jump between the two voltages, they're alternately going to be able to have sufficient oomph to make it through the modulator section and hit the collector plate in the back, or they're going to get reflected out. So if you think about it, you have three categories of particles then, ones that always make it through no matter what happens, uh, ones that never make it through no matter what voltage you're at, and the special population that does or doesn't make it in. And that's the principle behind the synchronous detection for a lot of these Faraday cups that I'm talking about today. What we do is we only lock into the alternating current that's produced by those particles who have an energy per charge that falls uh, within that range of uh, two adjacent voltages we're dropping back and forth in. So when I want to make a measurement with one of these Faraday cups, I don't look at the total current hitting these collector plates. I just look at the current that's varying at exactly the same frequency as the modulation frequency. And this is, I think, um, one of the real keys to how these Faraday cups work. If I have a solar flare and it's producing ionizing radiation that's generating all sorts of weird currents uh, within the collector plates and the instrument, if I have UV coming in um, and it's hitting the collector plates and, and releasing electrons through the photoelectric effect. If I have thermionic emission, pick whatever noise source you want. Unless that noise source knows to have a component varying at our modulation frequency, we don't pick that up. Um, and so the Faraday cup is, uh, if it does the synchronous uh, measurement, is intrinsically insensitive to ionizing radiation, to UV radiation, to no mechanical noise if it's not at our uh, modulation frequency. This is one of the reasons why Faraday cups, I would, I would claim, are really good for operating in um, intense operating environments. If you want something that you're confident will always be able to measure the solar wind, even in the midst of a major solar energetic particle event, um, or you know, passing through the radiation belts or what have you, uh, the synchronous detection is very powerful for removing those noise terms.
Now, what does uh, an actual sequence of measurements look like to sweep out uh, the velocity distribution function of some population of particles? So imagine here on the top left, I've just drawn a standard Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. The mean energy of these uh, particles is somewhere around uh, 1300 eV, and it has some thermal spread given by some temperature. And now consider three ranges of particles. Um, you know, I'm shading them red, green, and blue as we move up in energy. So on the high voltage power supply, as a function of time, I'll oscillate back and forth between one range of voltages. And in this lower set of voltages, as that oscillates back and forth, only the particles in, say, this red part of the spectrum produce a current. Uh, when I jump up to the next set of voltages for my next measurement, only the particles in the green energy range are going to produce a current. And then when I jump up to the um, blue voltage range, only the particles in this energy range make a signal. So as a function of time, the Faraday cup oscillates back and forth in some voltage range. That produces a AC coupled current due to the ions or electrons in that range. Um, and then we have electronics that measure that signal. And I'll give you an example in detail for SPC of how that signal processing works later in this presentation. Then we jump to the next range. You get a different AC amplitude. And the amplitude of that AC signal is just given by the number of particles sitting within that energy range. So a total measurement sequence, if you would, would entail the Faraday cup starting in a lo the lowest voltage range oscillating back and forth, measuring the AC component of the ions or electrons that have an energy per charge falling in that window, and then jumping up and then jumping up and then jumping up, sweeping through voltage until you get to the top range, and then going back down and beginning. And then depending on the spacecraft and the instrument, you might have one collector plate in the back and you're just measuring the current in each of those energy per charge windows. Um, you might have multiple collector plates so you're actually able to determine the flow angles precisely that the plasma is flowing at. Um, and you might have a spinning spacecraft, as I'll illustrate. Maybe you're measuring this in different directions. So if you think about it, I, I just showed you a Faraday cup measuring what I would call a reduced distribution function. Uh, intrinsic property of Faraday cups is they have huge fields of view. And you can see that like looking into these uh, uh, three examples here. This is on the upper right, one of the two uh, Faraday cups on the wind spacecraft. Here's the wind spacecraft here. It spins once every three seconds. There are two Faraday cups back to back on opposite sides of the spacecraft. And so every one and a half seconds, one of them sees the solar wind as they pass uh, looking directly at the sun. Here you have the Discover Faraday cup. And we're looking at an angle here. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting about this one is Discover always looks straight at the sun. Um, here, I think I, we took this photo at like a, a 20 degree angle or so from normal into the cup. And if you look carefully, you can see three wedges, three metal plates on the back of the um, Triana or Discover Faraday cup. And you can kind of see intuitively, I hope, that just by looking at the relative uh, area of those three collector plates, you can imagine if the solar wind's flowing in at this angle on average, then I'm going to get a very different current on those three collector plates. Uh, and so that gives me some of my three-dimensional information on Discover. Even though it points directly at the sun all the time, uh, it's able to figure out not just the uh, reduced distribution function of the solar wind, the number of particles as a function of energy, but it can tell you exactly what angle those particles are flowing at um, as you step up in energy. And so you can use that to determine the vector velocity uh, the temperature and the density uh, just with one sun point in spacecraft. Now, I'm going to make another observation while we're looking at this. The geometric factor of your typical Faraday cup is going to be huge compared to, say, an electrostatic analyzer. Um, typically, when they're on the same spacecraft, it, it can be like a factor of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 difference in geometric factor. Um, for instance, the, um, you know, maybe Discover Wind might have a geometric, uh, a factor of uh, something like 50 or 100 uh, square centimeters to radians. So they're really good if you want to make very high signal to noise measurements in a very short uh, period of time. It's, it's not uncommon on the wind spacecraft, for instance, to have a, a signal noise of hundreds or thousands in each individual measurement. 
So you can make really precise measurements of flow angles. You can make really precise uh, measurements at a pretty high time cadence. This, just to show you a, a more extreme example of large field of view in multiple collector plates, is the Voyager spacecraft. Now, I've kind of shrunk this down. The Voyager spacecraft is is practically uh, you know, half a meter across. It's a, a gigantic uh, sensor because it had to see much weaker currents very far from the sun. Um, and it had separate Faraday cups, basically, each with its own um, collector plate to give it a wide field of view and be able to measure flow angles. There's actually a fourth Faraday cup added on the side to make sure that during planetary encounters, there was a high probability that it could see both magnetospheric plasma and solar wind heading you know, mostly radially away from the sun. So how do you determine 3D properties with a Faraday cup, even though it just measures that reduced distribution function? Well, you can have uh, a fixed spacecraft, uh, sorry, uh, a sun-pointed spacecraft or some other three-axis stabilized spacecraft and use these collector plates to get uh, 3D data. You can have a spacecraft like wind where it's rotating uh, once every three seconds in this case. And so we can do a kind of variety of um, tomographic reconstruction of the 3D properties of the plasma. Uh, or you can do something like the approach on the Spectre-R spacecraft. This is the BMSW Faraday Cup system. And this is six Faraday Cups. Uh, three of them point straight at the sun. Three of them are canted at different angles. And between them, they scan simultaneously through the solar wind at different angles uh, or at different voltages. And so they're able to make uh, extremely rapid measurements of the solar wind properties. Now, here's a little sketch on the left that shows you how the Faraday cups work on the wind spacecraft. What we do is um, the Faraday cups the settles on some uh, high voltage window setting, the spacecraft rotates, uh, and then while it rotates, each Faraday cup makes measurements uh, along 20 different angles, da -da 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 -da, uh, centered around the sun, a couple in the back uh, as well. Uh, and then when that Faraday cup is rotated, so it's away from the sun, it increments to its next high voltage setting. You've got about a second and a half for that to settle down as the spacecraft's rotating. And then it repeats those measurements on the same angles at the next high voltage, and then goes around, increments the next high voltage window. And over the course of about a minute and a half, um, that Faraday cup steps through uh, an entire range of angles and voltages to make um, a kind of map of the reduced distribution function of the solar wind ions uh, as a function of um, angle. So let me just show you here uh, from a paper we published in, uh, I believe, uh, 2000 and, um, oh gosh, when was that? Maybe 2003 on measuring temperature anisotropies with uh, the wind Faraday cups. And what you're seeing here is the exact same protons, like same moment in time, um, same proton flow basically, but what we're plotting is the reduced distribution function seen uh, when the Faraday cup was scanning at three different angles relative to the magnetic field, 17 degrees from the magnetic field, 31 and 60 degrees. And if you look, hopefully what you can notice is um, it's maybe not that dramatic, but there's a slightly different Maxwellian width here to the solar wind protons. And again, it's not that um, these were taken at different moments in time and the temperature of the solar wind happened to change. These were actually collected simultaneously at just at different angles. Um, and what you can see is the, the width of the plasma in um, speed, in this case, I translated those um, voltages and the speeds, the width is different. And this is a log scale, so if I plot this a linear scale, it would be even more dramatic. What you're seeing is the temperature anisotropy of the protons. So a Faraday cup, um, if it's on a spinning spacecraft where you have multiple sensor heads, can do a really nice job measuring kinetic aspects of the solar wind or, or magnetospheric plasma or atmospheric plasma, such as temperature or pressure anisotropies. And, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to avoid going into like too much um, details of the science that you can do with the Faraday cup data. But what I want to show you is uh, when you have really high signal noise, really accurate measurements, like what's some of the kind of the cool physics that you can do with data from these instruments. So, here uh, was from a paper in 2002 on the left. I'm plotting uh, the ratio of the perpendicular to the parallel temperature minus one. So when it's zero, the parallel and perpendicular temperatures are exactly the same. So the plasma is isotropic. It has a single temperature. 
And I'm plotting that versus parallel proton plasma beta. So the ratio of the thermal plasma pressure, uh, NKT, divided by the magnetic pressure, B squared over 2 mu naught in uh, SI units. And what you can see is, uh, you know, when beta is low, there's a pretty wide range in observed um, temperature anisotropy. You know, it can go all the way up to, um, you know, 3 to 1, 4 to 1 in the temperature ratio. But at high beta, there's kind of a narrow range. Um, and this is a follow-up paper by Peter Hellinger in 2006 uh, that illustrates um, what the explanation is for the contours of the distribution of observed um, temperature anisotropies. What's happening is, uh, as you go to higher and higher beta in the plasma, different kinetic microinstabilities are kicking in that limit the stable pressure or temperature anisotropy that the plasma can support. So if the temperature anisotropy is too large, the plasma will automatically start uh, spontaneously generating growing fluctuations. Those fluctuations scatter the particles in phase space, lower the temperature anisotropy, and, and um, restore the plasma in equilibrium. Uh, for T perp greater than T parallel, so on the top of these plots, the cyclotron on the left, the mirror instability on the right are expected to limit the temperature anisotropy. Uh, both for T perp over T parallel less than one, it's the fire hose instability. Uh, that's expected to limit uh, the plasma. And what I'm showing on these dashed contours uh, are the growth rate of those instabilities in units of the cyclotron frequency. So the larger this number, the more rapidly the instability is expected to grow. And therefore, the more kind of violently the plasma is going to resist um, sustaining that kind of temperature anisotropy. So by being able to very precisely measure these temperature anisotropies, if you compare these different curves of constant instability growth rate with the observed distribution of the temperature anisotropies, you can see that on the right, we're able to show very compellingly that the mirror instability appears to be the dominant plasma instability that limits T perp greater than T parallel in the solar wind. And it's this oblique fire hose instability um, that's limiting the uh, cases where T parallel is greater than T perp in the solar wind, all at high beta. So you can not only see that plasma instabilities actually act on the plasma uh, with these ferry cup data, but you can distinguish between different physical theories uh, if you know you have a high quality measurement of that temperature anisotropy. Uh, even at a, a lower level of uh, detail here, I'm just going to show some other examples when you have some really precise measurements. We can measure the alpha particle temperature anisotropy as well. Uh, here's a paper we published in 2013 where the color shading is the ratio of the alpha particle perpendicular temperature and isotropy perpendicular temperature to the proton perpendicular temperature. Uh, and the y-axis is the differential flow between alphas and protons along the magnetic field. They don't necessarily have the exact same velocity, and we can measure that as a function of beta on the x-axis. There's a particular category of theories for ion cyclotron resonant heating of the solar wind that predicts that within these two horizontal dash lines, you could have superheating of the alpha particles. And sure enough, what we found was um, as long as beta was less than about two, uh, the alpha particles in the solar wind on average are about seven times hotter than the protons when the differential flow is within that narrow range. So in this case, precision measurements of differential flow velocities and alpha and proton temperatures and temperature and isotropies lets you do some really cool precision physics tests in the solar wind. And here on the right, uh, I'm just showing some work by Ben Maruka. On the left, another example of one of these uh, bounding cases of the proton temperature and isotropy versus proton beta. And what Maruka showed was, if you look at alpha particles, this is alpha particle temperature and isotropy versus alpha particle uh, plasma beta. Even though the alpha temperature and isotropy and the proton de temperature and isotropy are not in any one moment in the solar wind correlated well with each other, when you look at them individually, you can see that plasma instabilities act individually on the alpha particles and limit their uh, temperature and isotropies. So I think very cool. Uh, this is an example from uh, that Spectre R BMSW investigation you know, with the six Faraday cups. And I mentioned you know, that allows you to make really high speed measurements. Um, and what they're able to do in this paper is measure, in this case, density fluctuations going all the way up to uh, about 60 hertz. Uh, so 60 times a second measurements of the total density of protons in the solar wind. 
compare that to, as this paper was doing, similar studies of density power fluctuations on the wind spacecraft, and you're really only going, able to go up to about a tenth of a hertz, um, you know, in part because you have a spinning spacecraft, so you only have a um, three-second cadence or so in these measurements. Okay. Uh, sorry, someone just tried to call me. Can you hear me? Anyone hear me? Oh, yeah, we can still hear you, Justin. Oh. Yep, you're good. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so um, now I mentioned that the back of the collector plate is um, just a simple conducting plate. Um, on wind and discover, we use the combination of various coatings uh, on uh, magnesium, different coatings to ensure the long-term um, stability of the surface so that there wasn't oxidation, um, certain flashings to reduce uh, risk of magnetization and, and other things. Um, but it, ultimately, you know, what we have is like a, a pretty stable, low reactivity metal surface. So what's nice about that? Um, what it gives you is very long term stability and accuracy. So um, it's, you know, some instruments w which have fabulous um, uh, performance capabilities. And, and my point here is to focus on Faraday cups. I'm not trying to diss uh, other types of instruments. I'm trying to just stress the distinctions. Um, in particular, what makes Faraday cups uh, interesting. When you have some kind of conversion surface, like a multi-channel plate, an electrostatic analyzer, the efficiency of that conversion surface of taking an incoming ion and producing a, a burst of electrons that can then be measured and detected as a pulse, that efficiency changes with time. So it can be really challenging to monitor the long-term response and absolute calibration uh, of your instrument. When you just have a metal plate, there's really not much that can happen. Um, and so here's an illustration from a paper in 2006 that tries to capture this. What we did is we took the, um, what I consider to be the gold standard of absolute density of the solar wind, which is to look at the quasi-thermal uh, noise line and the plasma fluctuations. So we took the wind waves instrument, which can measure the electron plasma frequency, You'll recall the electron plasma frequency just scales linearly with the square root of the electron number density. And that's it. I mean, it's measuring a frequency. So uh, you, can, you can measure that very precisely. And what we're looking at here is the um, typical percentage difference on the wind spacecraft between the electron density as determined by the plasma line and the measured proton density, but it's twice the alpha density. And that too is just because the alphas are doubly, but they're fully ionized. So for every proton for the solar wind to be neutral, uh, there must be one electron. And for every alpha, there have to be two electrons. Um, and so what you can see is on average, uh, there was about a 5% difference between um, what the um, alpha plus, sorry, proton plus twice alpha implied electron uh, density was and what the electron plasma line measurement was. Now, why is there a difference? You know, I'll, I'll give you a couple um, uh, possible causes. One thought was there are minor ions and the minor ions have different ionization states. So they'll contribute to the total uh, ionization state of the solar wind and C4, C5, O6, O7, you know, that's a lot of electrons, even if they're not uh, at all as abundant. Um, this gray bar was our kind of estimate of what the the typical contribution of the total electron density is for minor ions in the solar wind. So there's still a four or 5% difference. Um, one of our thoughts was that um, in this early analysis back in 2006, we didn't yet have a code that was reliably analyzing the proton beams in the solar wind. So we have a hunch that if we go back now with uh, more robust codes that we've developed since then that capture the proton beam, uh, we might be able to decrease uh, uh, this difference even more. But you know, my, my point here is not to agonize over the 3% difference. It's to point out that uh, these different shades of gray are differences, these differences on a yearly interval over the first like 11 years of the wind uh, mission. And what you can see is um, there's very little uh, long-term secular variation. There's a little bit of a solar cycle variation, but that's about it. Um, and so you can see that on a decade timescale without any active intervention on our part to like reset the response of the instrument, um, you've got a very nice absolute measurement of the um, solar wind. On the right-hand side, I'm showing 
We usually add an internal calibration system to the instrument that lets us inject uh, known currents into the front end of the uh, cups where currents are converted into voltages. And again, this allows us to verify the stability uh, of the measurement electronics part. So here you can see cup one and cup two on the wind spacecraft. Um, and we're looking at uh, just the response to a known calibration current. And the drifts were about 0.3% and 0.1% and per decade. Your eye might be drawn to this annual variation, which, which is, you know, sinusoidal, but kind of weirdly shaped. Um, here, what you can see is the electronics uh, temperature, which varies by about uh, four degrees C over the course of a year. And here you can see our distance to the sun. And if you're wondering why that isn't just a, a sine wave, it's because, you know, wind would go out to L1, it would go back to L2, it would go around the moon. So it, it wasn't just simply um, at Earth's distance from the sun. But what's happening is the um, spacecraft temperature is changing uh, by a couple degrees, uh, just because of our distance from the sun and the electronics. And I could tell you why, but there's some capacitors in there that have like a part per thousand variation. And that winds up giving you like a, you know, 0.05 or so percent variation in the uh, absolute response to the instrument. If we really cared about trying to nail down our absolute um, density response to like the 0.1% level, we'd track down that capacitor and its variation. So what can you do with that kind of long-term stability? Um, here's, here's one cool plot. Uh, this was published by Alterman uh, and Casper last year. And the different colors are over the course of the wind mission to date, uh, which now spans, you know, an entire 22-year uh, solar cycle. You can see the helium abundance uh, versus time. And the blue curves are low-speed solar wind and going up um, to the red curves. And the purple curves are high-speed solar wind. And this dashed line is the sunspot number. And so you can see one of the cool discoveries that came from wind with its extended stable baseline um, is that you have a clear solar cycle uh, dependence on the helium abundance with time and sunspot number. And so the more solar activity is, the more helium there is, although the you know, magnitude of the dependence on solar activity is clearly a function of the solar wind speed. Slower wind has a stronger sensitivity. One of the cool things about getting up to 22 years when Alterman, Ben Alterman made this plot, um, it was just immediately obvious that there is a lag between when the sunspot number goes up and then when the helium abundance goes up. And then when he looked a little more closely, he realized uh, people had talked about an overall lag before, but you can actually see that there's a lag that depends on the speed of the solar wind. So here, here's the, the shift that you have to put on the sunspot number to get it to maximally correlate with the helium abundance. And what you see is um, as solar activity starts rising, the amount of helium in the solar wind starts going up due to awesome things about how the corona works that we don't understand yet. Um, but it impacts slow solar wind first. And then, uh, you know, within uh, with about a hundred uh, day lag or so. Uh, and then as um, the solar activity continues to rise, the helium abundance starts to increase in faster solar wind. And by the time you're at what oh, the wind spacecraft in the ecliptic would consider to be um, fast solar wind, you know, at like 550 kilometers per second, it's a full year offset between um, the solar wind uh, sunspot number going up and um, uh, and when the um, helium abundance jumps up. I'm just noticing um, uh, okay, I'm just going to point out something. Dan, I don't agree with, I saw there's a chat going on. Dan, I don't know if I agree with you about the the, the counting number. I mean, the the current and the, the number of particles are about the same, but you're absolutely right. Like an ESA with an MCP, what I think is amazing about an MCP is it can count individual particles. Um, and, you know, we need like 10 to the three, 10 to the four electrons or, or ions to produce a detectable signal. So there's some really nice uh, comments in the discussion about, you know, some of the distinctions between Faraday cups and other instruments. So I, I definitely agree there. And there was a question about whether we have a black coding for UV suppression inside the sensor? Um, and, and no, um, there are definitely styles of Faraday cups that put on some kind of UV suppression to try to minimize photoelectron emission. 
Um, but we don't do that and we're not, we don't have to do that because of that synchronous detection I described. So um, the Faraday cup points at the sun uh, in the case of solar probe, you know, it's getting hit by like 400 times the UV flux you'd get at one AU. So it's giving off a ton of uh, photoelectron current um, on the collector plates, but two things happen. One, we have a grid that sits at about minus 50 volts. We call it the suppressor grid uh, right on top of the collector plate. So it prevents um, electrons from truly escaping. They come out and then they get deflected back. But also those photoelectrons are pretty constant. The solar uh, UV flux is not varying at our 200 hertz or 1,000 uh, hertz modulation frequencies, so we don't detect them. Now, I'll, I'll try to check the, uh, the, the chat every now and then. So a little summary of some pros and cons here. Uh, you know, I would say... In my experience, they're they're pretty easy to calibrate the energy field of view and geometry. I don't have to worry about like radii of curvature uh, in the um, high voltage parts and, and the impact that has on the field of view or the geometric factor or the energy response. Like you literally just you know put a voltmeter on the high voltage output, and there's just a one to one mapping. You know whatever the voltage is, that's the um, energy per charge of the particles that are are blocked. Uh, so easy to calibrate. The total response, you know, it's really just what's the effective collecting area of that exposed metal plate. And by effective, I mean you have to subtract out the blocking factor due to the grids, but then they tend to agree, uh, you know, very well. We, I have not had a calibration on the ground that didn't just quickly run into how well we understood what the true current was of the calibration beam we were using and, and not the uncertainties in the instrument itself. Uh, response doesn't change with time or species. So, you know, alphas have twice the charge. So one alpha particle hitting the collector plate will produce twice the current as a proton. Um, but the, the amount of current produced isn't like proportional to the energy of the particles. Um, so it's, you know, I can make a really nice stable measurement of the like alpha to, uh, proton um, temperature ratio Yep, we don't have to worry about counting rates getting too high. Um, you'll notice when I show um, a, um, a, a schematic for the circuit, we have a whole bunch of different gains. And so we just, you know, if the current gets higher and higher, we just jump to a lower gain. Uh, so we have a nice uh, dynamic range on the instrument. Um, that's true. There's no, there's no uh, conversion circuit that can get saturated. Um, and this one's a little subtle, but we have a very compact telemetry rate. So as I showed you, if I on Discover want to measure the vector velocity and the density and temperature of the protons, I measure reduced distribution function, and then I, I have the three collector plates currents. Um, I'm not trying to measure a three-dimensional velocity distribution function. So roughly speaking, I, I, I only need a cube root of the telemetry to, set, to capture the velocity, density, and temperature of you know, some ion species compared to um, an instrument that was measuring the full 3D VDF. Now, don't get me wrong. I also list that as a con here. I can't measure the full 3D VDF uh, with one Faraday cup in one direction, right? We don't have deflector plates. Uh, we don't have the capabilities of an electrostatic analyzer. You'd have to be on a spinning spacecraft uh, to capture you know, true 3D VDF uh, features and then to pull that out, you've got to sit there and learn how to do like basically tomographic reconstruction. So, you know, I'm always very envious when someone just shows raw data from an electrostatic analyzer and says, look what's happening in the VDF. Um, and you go, oh, yeah, I see. There's a beam and a heat flux and, you know, physics. Whereas if I have a, you know, rotating data on the wind spacecraft, I'll say like, well, if you spend three years thinking about it, <laughs> you'll you'll figure out that there's like a, you know, bimax well in and you can back that out or a proton beam, but it, it takes a lot of work to, uh, to pull that out of the data through reconstruction. And then another, what I would say is a, a big con um, or challenge for Faraday cups is there's a one-to-one -one ratio. You put in some voltage, that's the maximum energy per charge uh, that I can measure. So, you know, if I want to stop, um, let's see, um, 1200 kilometer per second protons, I need like a, you know, an eight kilovolt high voltage power supply. And I'm just, just doing that direct mapping. I don't have the, 
benefit of a uh, electrostatic analyzer where there's a ge geometric, you know, the curvature of the curved plates and their geometry gives you like a, a multiplicative factor. So, you know, with an ESA, you might be able to go up to, you know, 20, 30 KeV per charge for your particle selection, but you're actually only putting five, six, seven kilovolts uh, on your um, curve plates. And I, you know, I'm definitely jealous of that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move on now, and what I'm going to do is is dig into a little, with a little bit more detail some highlights of the um, uh, solar probe uh, cup. So here's a picture of the Parker Solar Probe spacecraft uh, undergoing um, an acoustic test, and here are the three instruments within the sweep investigation, two electrostatic uh, sets of electrostatic analyzers on the back of the spacecraft in the shadow, an electron ESA on the anti-RAM side of the spacecraft, an ion and electron uh, ESA. The ion ESA has a time of flight section on the RAM side, and then the solar probe cup. And here's a thermal model of the solar probe cup. Worst case, give you some of the mission-specific challenges for Parker Solar Probe. Worst case scenario, we're looking at something like 1,750 degrees C um, for that first grid and the opening for the cup. You can kind of make out SPC has a strut that lets it peer out from around the heat shield straight the sun all the time. So what happens at 1750 C? Very high temperatures. You're worrying about melting points of your materials, outgassing of constituents, the ultimate mechanical yield strength of your materials, uh, electrical insulation. Our high voltage insulators within the cup get up to around 1000 degrees C. So how do you stand off five, six kilovolts when your insulator is a thousand degrees Celsius? And you can get more unusual emission beyond photoelectron emission like thermionic emission. We have high thermal gradients. So the front of the sensor might be at, you know, 1200 degrees C. The back, which is only like 10 centimeters back, might be at like 700 C. Um, so that's a uh, huge thermal mechanical stresses on the sensors. And you know, by virtue of the solar probe mission with, you know, more than 20 encounters with the sun, you have multiple uh, stress cycles. So if we look in cross-section at SPC, how did we get around this? We have an electronics module in the back that only gets up to like a body 75 degrees C uh, maximum operating temperature. Uh, you have a support strut that has like a 300 degree C interface to the spacecraft, 750 degree C at the back of the um, sensor portion, this is made out of titanium. The sensor portion is made out of all manner of exotic refractory metal alloys, niobium C103, moly TZM. You know, basically look at the periodic table, the elements, look at all the refractory metals, and most of them are sitting in this cup at one point or another, uh, depending on our needs for mechanical strength, ease of machining, et cetera. This is the high voltage coax cable. That's a uh, niobium. Uh, welded around um, um, rods of synthetic sapphire crystal with a niobium wire run down the center um, to carry the high voltage out to the instrument. That's the, the lower high voltage for the suppressor grid to keep photoelectrons from escaping. Uh, and here are the coaxial cables, again, also just made out of niobium uh, that bring the signals back. So if you think about it, and this always just blows my mind, we're sitting close to the sun this might get up to 1800 degrees C. Um, the collector plates on the back are measuring, you know, picoamp signals in, uh, you know, hundreds of milliseconds, even though they're sitting at like a thousand degrees C. Um, and then just within tens of centimeters, we go back to this electronics box that's digitizing those signals. Uh, here, I'm not going to go through the block diagram, but just in cross section, you can see our high voltage grid uh, to minimize the, the loss of um, uh, currents um, through the high voltage insulators, given how hot they are. The insulators are actually just tiny little thin rods of synthetic sapphire crystal that pin the high voltage uh, grid in place in the center. Um, the grounded grids are just directly uh, pressed against the mechanical structure. If you're an enthusiast of Faraday cups on like Wind or Triana or Imp 8 uh, or Voyager, we would have hand-woven tungsten wire uh, 
uh, epoxied around uh, magnesium rings and then gold plated. None of that works for solar probe. That would all just melt immediately. The epoxy would fail. The gold would evaporate. Um, and so what we did is a um, acid etch. We lithographically deposited an image of the grid we wanted or its negative on a sheet of high purity tungsten. Then we etched the grid out, and then the grid is just a monolithic structure that we place within the sensor. Uh, here are the collector plates. They sit within a, a sapphire cup, basically, and then their signals come out the back. Um, and so here I mentioned I would show the measurement electronics. Um, here I'm just showing you have your four collector plates here. They're arranged in 90-degree wedges uh, in this alignment on the solar probe cup. And so you've got independent measurements of the like north, south, and east, west uh, flow angles with, with a redundancy. So if you lose a collector plate, you can still recover the full vector flow. And we have a current to voltage conversion process, um, a little bit of uh, bandpass filtering, and then we have three uh, levels of amplification. Um, so the cup digitizes 16 time series um, and converts these uh, AC coupled currents into um, AC uh, voltages and it digitizes the voltages. And then uh, another uh, cool advance on the solar probe cup development is we just do a digital uh, Fourier transform of those data to pull out the power at the modulation frequency, as opposed to kind of a more old school analog uh, lock-in process that was used for uh, earlier Faraday cups. I'm just gonna super quickly jump to a couple of things so there's time for discussion. Uh, this was a solar furnace in France where we did some initial prototype testing so we could shine a megawatt of sunlight uh, into one of the cups and measure things like how the emissivity changed over number of exposures and temperature close to the sun. Uh, here's some early development of our grids and our collector plates and its sapphire housing. This is a cross section of one of our high voltage cables under prototype development. So you can see the sapphire crystal that the nobium wire would run through with the high voltage and then little uh, sapphire spacers uh, and then the outer sapphire uh, nobium housing. There was some cool, um, basically we repurposed a bunch of IMAX style movie projectors to generate light in the lab so we could do uh, longer duration uh, thermal mechanical testing of the instrument. So here's a little video, one of our final simulations. Um, basically there's four film projectors shining enough sunlight in that this uh, cup thinks it's operating at about 15 solar radii from the sun. We have a particle accelerator sending an ion beam in and confirming that it's um, just sitting there, you know, thinking it's measuring the solar wind and, you know, about half a kilovolt, no impact to the noise level or the high voltage or the current draw um, at that uh, proximity to the sun. Um, this was our last photo of SPC sticking out on the side of the heat shield on solar probe um, right uh, before they put the second half of the encapsulation uh, fairing on uh, a couple days before launch. Um, and here was our first light data. Uh, they turned us on. We were pointed about 45 degrees away from the sun and we're not expecting to see the solar wind. And uh, about a uh, half an hour in the solar wind just happened to gust up at another angle and uh, we caught a nice glimpse of it. So that was our unexpected first light. Um, here's an example of a uh, reduced distribution function close to the sun in our first perihelion. You can see the proton peak, a substantial proton beam, uh, alpha particles, nice and hot compared to data at 1 AU. Um, and I'm not going to go through uh, all of this, but you know we got beautiful data through the uh, perihelion encounters. Uh, we used SPC for a couple really cool discoveries, one of which if I just draw your eye to the radial velocity, um, we would we discovered these velocity spikes, we call them, um, where the solar wind is just flooded with these very coherent periods where the solar wind jumps, speed jumps by hundreds of kilometers per second. The magnetic field uh, reverses in uh, polarity temporarily, and these are just some kind of crazy traveling uh, alphanic structure. Um, I'm going to jump to the end just to, in the interest of time. Some future applications. There's a set of Faraday cups led by uh, Joe Westlake at APL um, that are being built for the Europa Clipper mission that'll be used to study um, the depth of Europa's ocean by measuring very precisely the 
ionospheric and magnetospheric uh, plasma around Europa to improve the accuracy of magnetic induction measurements. That's pretty exciting. Um, the Heliosform mission is led by Harlan Spence at UNH, uh, and that would it's currently in phase A. That would be 10 spacecraft, each with a Faraday cup, um, measuring um, like three-dimensional structure of turbulence uh, in the solar wind, you know, really with multi-point measurements so you can understand the three-dimensional structure of turbulence. And I think there's um, a lot of really good use cases for Faraday cups for both operational space weather missions in the future um, and as a small resource uh, instrument for interplanetary probes where your telemetry or mass uh, are limiting your capabilities. And I think that was the last uh, slide that I had. Yep. So with that, you know, if, if there's any time, we could uh, have a little uh, Q&A. If I've, I've left three minutes to the hour and then I could stick around for a few minutes if people want to talk. Certainly. Uh, that would be great. Thank you so much, Justin. This is a fantastic uh, presentation. I already learned quite a bit. And as you, you already answered a few of the questions there in the chat, uh, I will mention for those who have to sign off that next week, we're going to be having uh, Gina DeBrasio, who's scheduled to discuss fluxgate magnetometers for space exploration. So be sure to tune in next week. Uh, and with that, I think one of the questions so far, uh, Lynn had asked as well about niobium. Uh, Lynn was just asking, you know, it's, it was used for several things in the Parker Solar Probe, and why niobium instead of, say, some other metal? Uh, you know, what's special about niobium as opposed to the tantalum or tungsten or something like that? You may have touched on that a little bit. Yeah, that's great. That's mm -hmm. great. So, so you know, tungsten's great because it has a ridiculous melting point and um, a, a very high work function, which means thermionic emission, total electron emission is low. Uh, but tungsten can become brittle. Um, at a particular at temperature, and it's very hard to machine and to weld. Uh, it turns out the niobium is soft enough that um, you know it, it, it can you can yield it and work with it. You can weld it uh, very nicely. So we found uh, uh, that niobium was a really nice refractory metal. And then there are alloys of, of niobium like C103 that have really nice um, strength capabilities. One of the challenges with solar probe cup was. Um, you know, the, the maximum temperatures that get to catch your attention, right? And that was definitely our initial focus in, in our technology readiness and technology development. But what we discovered is um, by launching on next to the heat shield, you know, let, let me just jump back a second. Um, look at us on the spacecraft. So we're launching on a Delta IV Heavy and we're bolted to the side of basically a 10 square meter uh, subwoofer. Uh, <laughs> and so what happens is, as we take off, the heat shield of the spacecraft absorbs the acoustic noise from the rocket. And so the cup saw about 200 G's worst case of vibration. Um, and so um, that mechanical uh, vibration was a real challenge. And so we needed to make sure we had materials with like really high uh, strengths. And so Lynn, that, that kind of set some of our, um, uh, some of our, um, material selection criteria beyond just making all out of tungsten. Uh, and Fran has a question and maybe we can even unmute Fran. Yeah. And yeah. you can just okay, ask. Thank you. Um, yes, Justin, as a, a, uh, a fellow si sibling on the uh, Voyager um, uh, family of plasma instruments working with, with Faraday cups, I love Faraday cups and I obviously with Voyager at Jupiter, we did a lot of good stuff. Um, when it got cold and we could measure the different species. What I worry about is the fact that they seem to be very well suited to high Mach number flows. And of course, in magnetospheres, we have problems with um, a low Mach number flow, basically. So I'm curious to know whether you have any ideas of how to adapt Faraday cups to work in a, in a low Mach number environment and yeah, I with multi-species. Absolutely. So if you, you know, and Fran, if you, if I go all the way back, you can see here's, here's me as a grad student agonizing over exactly what you were asking about. So um, here's a, a case in Triana where uh, the solar winds coming in at a 35 degree angle. And what you can see is uh, depending on the energy of the particles there, we, you know, we would call it refracting, right? So they're shifting over a little bit as they slow down and come back up. Um, as long as the particles coming in here, um, you know, still hit that limiting aperture, you're pretty good. But if the angle increases enough that they, you know, the particles coming from this edge 
don't hit this limiting aperture, but instead there's like a gap that you're not, you know, filling with particles here, then what happens, this, I, this might be a little technical for people, but just they, you know, just so they know what Fran and I are worrying about. Um, you get a collector plate that's not always illuminated with particles, not because you don't have particles at that energy, but just because of the way particles move in this selection thing. And what that does is it generates a signal at the frequency you're oscillating this detector. Um, and so you wind up getting a, um, you know, an oscillating signal um, that isn't real. You know, I, I, I've spent an hour talking about how amazing the instrument is because it, it doesn't detect signals that aren't real because they're not oscillating correctly. Well, this is one of the Achilles heels of the cup. So if you're dealing with a supersonic flow, you don't have this issue at all. Life is, life is grand, right? Um, it always bugged the heck out of me that the wind Faraday cup data looked beautiful in the magnetosphere in the magneto sheath when the flow is subsonic and that bugs the heck out of me because it, it shouldn't really work. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very nervous about, you know, interpreting data when we're um, in, you know, very low Mach number flows, sonic Mach number flows or thermal Mach number flows for exactly what Fran's talking about. A unexpected, unintentional development from the solar probe cup uh, that kind of helps may help with this. And that I would suggest for a low Mach number flow, I'm just going to jump over here. If you look at these grids, because we had to survive 200 G's and high temperature ratios, um, we wound up, and because we were using this photolithographic etch process, we wound up um, introducing a really unusual geometry to the grids. The grid wires, I'm putting that in quotes, are they're very deep compared to their width. They're, they're more than twice as deep as they are wide. That produces something really annoying for the solar probe cup, which is um, the effective area of the grids drops off very quickly with angle of incidence. By the time you're like 20 degrees over, like next to no plasma can come through. Very annoying for solar probe cup but acceptable because at those large angles of incidence, we've got an ESA on the side of the spacecraft that's having the time of its life, making beautiful 3D, you know, VDFs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I realized was what you could do for a subsonic plasma is you could put that grid in the cup on purpose so that the cutoff in, in, in transmission was happening from the grid, which doesn't have any time dependent effect and not, you know, you see where I'm going, right, Ben? So, so that I think would allow you to have like a very well understood controlled ionospheric or, or sub uh, sonic measurement. You're still going to have to now have multiple sensor heads to make a 3D measurement if you need it in the subthermal plasma. Right. But that would be my uh, recommendation. And, you know, if, if you or anyone else is ever curious about how to make those grids, I'd be happy to provide some vendors and, and information on that. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, well, let's see. Cool. I had a request for um, some of those awesome um, high speed measurements on SPC. So let me see if I can find it and then I'm going to pull it up. Yeah, it's right. Uh, Maria. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think this was, this was, this was like an awesome unadvertised feature when we launched. So here, what you're seeing this is a paper by Daniel Vetch. Um, so, and this encounter, um, uh, this was one of the first, I think this was the first encounter, SPC is measuring the proton VDF um, like about 20 times a second. So 20 times a second, it measures the reduced distribution function versus phase speed. We converted voltage into speed, assuming everything's a proton. And so you've got like a Maxwellian with like a beam tail thing going on here. Um, but what we can tell the cup to do is every time it makes one of these scans, it figures out where the peak of the VDF is. And we can pre-program before the encounter because we we're not able to talk to the spacecraft in the 11 days around the uh, encounter. But we can pre-program a mode where it figures out where the peak is, then it picks an energy window some kilometers per second below the peak, and then it just measures in that one energy window for some number of seconds. So we went into a mode where, uh, you know, we went like, uh, am I going to get this right? We went like 50 kilometers per second below the peak of the solar wind. And then we just sat there and made like a couple hundred measurements 
um, in this mode where we're just recording the current on the, the four collector plates. So if you think about it, that lets you measure how the flow angle and the flux of the solar wind is varying at 293 hertz uh, in this case. So what could that let us do? Um, if you look on the right from uh, Vetch's paper, the blue curve is a Fourier transform of the uh, power and fluctuations in velocity as a function of frequency. And you can see you hit a floor, which is the noise floor of the instrument. Here in the red or orange, what we're doing is we're using the um, this flux angle, uh, basically, mode. We're measuring at 293 hertz, the fluctuations. And what you can see is this allows us to extend the noise floor down by more than a decade, right? So instead of hitting the noise floor at, you know, around uh, 0.5 hertz or so, we're hitting the noise floor um, at around, you know, eight or nine hertz. Um, and there's a dynamic here, you know, the closer we get to the sun, the higher the fluxes will be. So maybe we can uh, get to higher frequencies. But um, of course, you know, when we get too close to the sun, the plasma is coming in at a large angle because we're moving super quick. So SPC might not see it. But this let us do some really awesome measurements of like uh, helicity and uh, correlations between plasma fluctuations and magnetic field fluctuations at, you know, what I would call kinetic scales well beyond the like ion MHD scale. Um, and there's all sorts of neat stuff you'll be, you'll be seeing us doing. And, and those data are, are released as part of the SPC releases. So you can, um, you can uh, take a look at it. Um, uh, you know, you can see that there's like different correlations between the plasma wiggles and the field depending on where you are in phase speed relative to the rest frame of the protons. So that, that's going to allow us to do some really cool uh, physics on, on what the actual sub-ion scale dissipation physics is. Uh, let's see, there was a question about mentioned thermal equilibrium distribution measurements. How do you calibrate for difference between Maxwellian and non-Maxwellian measurements? So I'd say uh, there's a couple ways we'd, we'd do it, you know, depending on your definition of calibrate. Um, so we fit a bi-Maxwellian. We also fit like two component bi-Maxwellian for when there's a, a beam. And often for the protons, we find that, um, you know, they're pretty well described as just the two bi-Maxwellians drifting relative to another seems to capture uh, most of the information in the VDF. Uh, but we also calculate the moments of the distribution. And so one of the ways you can flag that something really funky is happening is if the you know, the properties you get by combining the two by Maxwellians diverges significantly from what you get from the moment calculation. You know that there's something unusual happening in the BDF and you should go and, and look at it. And an example of that that we found is um, very often we're finding with solar probe, the, the BDF has a pronounced skew. Right, do I have that right? Is it kurtosis? I think it's skew. You know, it doesn't look like a bell curve. It, it's like, you know, it's, it's broadened and not just like hotter, like it's bent out of shape from like a classic um, Maxwellian, which, you know, is indicative of, we think of, you know, some really interesting non-equilibrium physics happening close to the sun. So looking at the, the skew and, and other higher order moments of the VDF, and as opposed to fitting a, an analytic VDF to it is a really powerful way to, to um, identify non-Maxwellian physics. Excellent. I think, yeah, that was our, our final question there. So yeah, in the interest of time, I definitely want to thank you again, Justin. This was this is terrific. And it's going to be a great reference too for folks to, you know, sign back in and watch the YouTube stream if they need to from our channel. Um, so yeah, with that, yeah great. thank you again for everything. It was again, fascinating to see the, especially the solar probe, you know, images there and just the engineering considerations as you put this uh, detector right in the face of the sun and, and, and watch what it does. So that was a unique experience. Okay. Certainly. Take care, everybody. Great. Thanks everyone. Have a good week.